go. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer. My good buddy, Michael Wan, is with me. And Michael, we've reached drinking age. This is Playing the Glass Bead Game, episode number 21. 21. We are finally mature enough to get sloppy drunk. To get sloppy drunk. And, and I don't, I'm not a sloppy drunk person. I do like to have some cocktails, but I'm like a two cocktail. Like every once in a while, I'll have a third if it's stretched out over a long period of time. But I'm not, I mean, have you ever seen me like drunk or anything? I, I'm just not into that. Sloppy You're just drunk. not into that. But I do, I do really, really like a very fancy cocktail, you know? <laughs> it's been a long time since I drank cocktails. Yeah. It's been a long time. There are times that I kind of miss like drinking a beer every once in a while, but it's it's not part of my system and it's not in my system anymore. I've never been a beer drinker ever like in my life. Like I have been into ciders, like interesting artists and ciders here and there for a while, but suddenly I have found a kind of beer that I like. What is that? So it's these, like, it's like these are now becoming, well, I've always liked lambics as well, which are sort of similar, but sour beer is now a thing. Like it's very popular, uh, like it's suddenly everywhere. But um, some of them have like sort of a little bit of a fruitiness to them. They're not sweet, right? They're sour and they're kind of tart and a little bit, some of them are have fruity kind of background flavors to them and whatnot. And I love them because they taste like like a warhead or a sour patch kit or something like that, but not sweet. Like it has that, you know, like that that feeling that like takes all the skin off the roof of your mouth and stuff like that. I love that, right? So I've uh, been experimenting with the sour beers a little bit, uh, but mostly I'm a cocktail person. I like me. That's what it seems. That's what it seems. And so now now that we're at episode twenty one, what do we have in store today? Well. Uh, in store, like, well, are you talking about what <laughs> what cocktail should we drink this morning? Or you tell I'm, me. I'm like, you're the captain of the I'm, ship. I'm just curious because you were more of a beer guy. If you ever got into fancy cocktails, if you've ever had a cocktail where you were like, wow, that was really interesting or that was phenomenal. I don't think uh, I have consumed any sort of liquor since my 20s. Oh, wow. And so it's been a long time. And when I did drink uh, liquor, it was always like as a highball. Gotcha. Okay. So like like a Tom Collins kind of thing or like. A- vodka tonic. I think vodka I would tonic drink or- that. Right. I would think that would be what I would drink back in those days. But like the, the whole um, cocktail and uh, that, that is not part of my experiential path. Have, were you ever, a, were you ever a whiskey drinker? No. I suspect that if you were to if you were to drink liquor now, you'd be a whiskey drinker. Maybe, maybe. Like I could see that now. Like you know, I I, I know the the like the um, the like I have an image in my mind of the of the whiskey drinking experience. So yeah, I could see that. Well, my sense of you comes with a hat. A man who wears a hat, right? That, but also my sense of you. Well, some of these things I know for sure, but also my further sense is you like like leather and and rocks and t- like you like things that have like, you know, s- like smells that are like you like smells, right? Mm-hmm. Like that leather, tobacco, smoke, sort of like man kind of smell. Like those are the best whiskeys, right? Like I love that kind of whiskey. And you can drink just a very small amount of it, but glean all of those sort of notes and sensations from it. And I have a feeling that you would be into that, right? I could see, I could see how that could fall in. Certainly, I, I am guilty as charged as it relates to uh, the leather and the aromas and the, the rich earthiness. Like the way I see when you when you're really excited, which you haven't done this in a while either. You haven't shown me some creation of yours that you're very excited about or some new piece of leather that you got. But I would watch when you would show me them. You would sort of feel them like you liked feeling the texture. Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. And when you show me your favorite rock and you move it around in your hand. You're like really like 
trying to become one with the texture of the rock. Like I can sense that. So you, can- I have been accused in the past of fondling my, my, the, the things I like to touch. And I, I never thought that was exactly, at least the, 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 the feeling behind the accusation, I don't think was was accurate but what is accurate is yeah i do like to touch the stuff (laughs) you're very very tactile i'm a very tactile person exactly absolutely all right well well we don't well you know what we started this way i want to can i start with a real quick story please all right all right all right all right so um so i like the front porch of the house which i'm in And it is, I'm on a busy road and I've talked about this in the past. Like, you know, despite the fact that I'm on this very busy road that the property is like this wooded area in the back and it's this kind of like jewel. And the front, I like to sit on the porch and there's a decent amount of foot traffic. I just like to look at people. Maybe this, (laughs) I like to watch them go by. And the way the house is kind of positioned, um, both with the, the 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 angle of the street and the 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 trees and the shrubbery of the house before and afterwards like the house is the the house can easily be can disappear like you can miss it like i mean to this day i've been there for almost two years like coming from one direction like i still got to go slow because it's not obvious where the driveway is so that has always been the case. And right in the front yard, right in the front, and this is the front porch where we've got like that Google slice. You right, know, I, I was, was just going to say that, that makes sense. So many, yeah, that. so many weird things. But also when we first moved into the house, there was a tree which was cut down um, probably with a stump about five feet high and was just a stump. It was like kind of sad looking. And in the past year, there started to be growth from this stump. And the growth is just branches, like let's say no more than an inch in diameter, not really big branches. But over the course of the past year, this stump, which last year was just a stump, um, many, many, many branches have, have, have grown out from it and they have leaves on it. So now what actually, what you see on this, from this, from the stump tree is probably like, uh, at least 10 feet wide with foliage going, uh, touching down from the earth, going up to like, maybe like 15, 20 feet, like it exploded with all of this foliage. So now this hidden space is really, really, really hidden. Like, you know, if it wasn't hidden before, now I'm kind of like behind this thing. And I like to stand behind there. And that's been, um, it's been uh, really the spring and this, this, this summer has been an enjoyable place for me to just stand in the grass in between the front door and the sidewalk. And like, I can be even a little bit more hidden and watch the world go round. And as I sit there, like I've just paid a lot of attention to this tree and just kind of like thinking about it, just like, you know, the way I perceive reality. So that being said, so like I've got like the point I'm trying to paint right now is that I have a connection. I've watched this this kind of like change in a in this tree over the past in the over the past really the past six months with the foliage. But before that, like ever since I've been there, I've always looked at it and I've really liked it because it's got a human scale. Typically, trees don't have a human scale, like all the foliage is like 15, 20 feet off the ground is where it begins. So we're looking up to it versus like a shrub, which is on the earth, which is like, you know, at the same level as human, uh, five, six feet tall, you know, I have that sort of relationship. So all that being said, I've got this thing going on with this tree. I've talked about in the last couple episodes, just like uh, a, a connection, a deeper connection, a feedback loop, which I'm getting from the natural world. So all that said, all that said, uh, on Monday of this week, a big storm blew through the area heavy winds, like, you know, this sort of stuff, which I mean, I think anyone on the East Coast and even in, in the mid, in the Midwest, you know, this has been a time of, of like really high, uh, big storms after we have a really mild sort of summer and three branches, three, um, snapped off from this trip, three branches snapped off from this trip. So now I'm going to kind of like take a a slight um, uh, branch, if you will, onto the story. So one of my favorite things to do is make walking sticks. I have a whole process and that sort of thing. I've been doing that for a while. And, you know, we were talking about that, like, you know, just like, you know, my uh, the joy I get for making things and all this sort of stuff. 
And the look and the, the, the discovery, the finding the perfect walking stick is um, it's more or the base of it, like the actual wood itself. You know, there uh, I might look at 30, maybe a hundred different uh, potential sticks before I'm like, okay, this is the right one. And it's a combination of like how thick it is, the type of wood, is there curvature, all this different stuff. Like I've got like kind of like a way which I go about. So the point I'm trying to make is like, I got a point of reference. Like I know it's difficult to find this sort of sticks. I'm a very, like uh, uh, my, my, my yardstick for what I look for is very discriminating. And each of these three sticks are at, that broke off from this tree are perfect. Like in terms of what I look for, in terms of like their thickness and their, their um, the, the how straight they are, the little bit of curves. I'm like, these are perfect. And what's even more interesting is prior to this, the last three walking sticks I made were given to me. The original wood was given to me by someone who I know. And I had, and it took me about three years to go and work through each one of them and turn them into like a final walking stick. And I finished the, the third one in the spring of this year. And I haven't made a walking stick since then. And so now I've been given these three sticks from the tree, which ah. I've been connected to. So it's like, there are three. So it's like, I'm seeing this pattern. It's like, not just some random tree. It's a tree, which I have a connection to. And then on top of this, so like all of that, like the, that, that story of like how it was given to me, like, you know, the, the, the context in terms of which I've received these sticks, like, you know, it was all like, I knew that, all right, these are my next three sticks, which I'm going to work for. And I've been collecting wood for a little bit of time, preparing for like, what's going to be the next stick I'm going to make. But what makes these so, so unusual, so um, is one is typically when I have, when I find uh, wood right now, which I've used for a walking stick, if you could think about it in terms of like highway systems, like the trunk of a tree would be your main highway. That would be like in the East Coast, it's 95. And then you'll have like the main, the branches that come off the trunk, they would be like secondary highways. And then the, the ones which branch off of those branches, those typically were the, were the wood which I would use for sticks. So they're tertiary, they're tertiary sticks upon the, or, or wood within the tree. The, what, the wood which was given to me from this tree, they were from the, um, from the, the trunk itself or they connect to the trunk. So they have like, no matter how you want to describe it, they have a different kind of like cellular function within the tree. They're stronger. They have a more important um, infrastructure on what would be the tree. So I've got like a very special, very special wood from that perspective, which I'm like, all right, this is, I know is going to be different. But then on top of that, they have all of the buds which would be the next layer of branches, which would come off of that. But they're in this very, very like neophyte stage, like it's very beginning. So they're just like kind of lumps right now. So what I know is the, uh, at the end result of what these sticks are going to look like are going to be completely different than any other type of, 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 of walking stick, which I've made in the past, because my process is, is usually like a smooth piece of wood, but these have these bumps. So I know it's going to be a completely different style of walking stick. All three of them are going to be that way. So I'm very excited about this process. And I knew the last one took me three years. So now I know I've got like a three-year window. So the making of them and then also the discovery of who are going to be the owners of those sticks is just has me very excited. So I wasn't planning on telling that story, but we kind of like backed into it. So, so that's how this week has been. It's been a lot of like these things of, which have always been around are beginning to show themselves to me as like what the purpose will be. Yeah, I like that story. And I like the way you said the discovery of who will be the owners, right? I like that, the discovery. It's because it is a process, right? Like I showed that pyramid with the seashells that Masaki gave me. Like it had long been my favorite pyramid of his. He showed it to me the first time we ever did a show together. And, you know, suddenly when I was moving away, he decided that that pyramid, he had actually made it, you know, even though he didn't know me when he made it, that, that right, I was the right. rightful owner of that pyramid. And so he, he you know, like I, I, it was always my favorite one, but I never in a million years imagined he, I never even thought about whether he'd give it to me or, you know what I mean? Right, but right. It felt like, okay, like that's all I, I love. I think that as a person who creates things, when you can get just the right thing in the hands of just the right person, like the, you know, like the, it was made, you know, so it was, it was literally made for them, whether you knew it or not at the moment you were making it. 
yeah. without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and, you know, and that's, 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 I think, uh, you know, in the feedback loop of the creator and then the person who receives it, like there's something there and both parties, both parties uh, benefit from it. Like, you know, there's a real joy uh, and excitement, like when you're making something like, who's this going to be for? And then when you give it to someone like, and then when they receive it and they hear the story, like it, it, it's, it's to me, that's very much part of like the, 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 the fundamental nature of human beings and like, you know, how we interact with one another. Absolutely. And you sharing a story you hadn't planned to share. It has inspired me to share one as well. Please do. We talked about this actually in one of the um, uh, cafe groups last week, and it's been something that I had been looking at for a while, but there's this trend. I don't know if you've heard of this, um, but there's this trend amongst wealthy people that seem, seems to have really picked up during the time of the lockdown of what's called trophy trees, right? New status symbol for high net worth homeowners is, are trophy trees. Okay. Okay. And so it's, there's been articles uh, in but that one you like from the UK that has all the ads all around that I was at the Guardian or the Daily Mail or one of those. Daily ones. Like, Mail. Daily Mail. So there's an article of them, them right? And then there's also uh, this article in the Wall Street Journal. And then there's this article here, which I think is probably the most informative um, from Treescapes and Plant Works, right? It's a new horticulture trend. And what's very interesting about these trees is what they do is they actually cut them up at the location where they chopped them down from. They cut them into like sizable chunks. They transport them to the new place that they will be and then they put them back together and supposedly it is still living, right? Um, so basically the, there's three main types of tr tr trophy trees, living, artificial, and preserved. Living trees require a complicated process of acquisition, transport, and installation. The trees are generally sliced vertically into multiple pieces and then reassembled using steel rods and cables. Each slice has roots and foliage, making it a separate tree. Eventually, the bark will grow around each tree, giving the look of the original single large tree, right? And this costs up to $250,000, and people are doing this, you know, it's like the hot new thing. But one of the other, uh, I think it was in this article, there was a talk, they, they were talking about how these trees are sort of like portals, right? That like they're like there was, I can't remember if it was this article or a different one I looked at, but that some people are using these trees to basically look into other dimensions or to, or opening portals. And if you even look at this wall over here, right? Look at the wall of wood that they have to sort of accompany it, right? It's kind of an interesting, you know, it looks like what we think of as tree rings. And think about what we've been taught since we were kids about like, trees keeping track of the years with rings. And I think you and I have even discussed in the show about like what other information may be compressed in these trees, like nature's kind of hard drives, right? Or, or storage devices and whatnot and what can be gleaned from them, right? And you see a lot of times out there like chopped off tree trunks. And like, if you go and sit on those and meditate, what can you actually absorb from that? Right. But this idea that they're kind of dissecting and putting trees back together and that this is a stat like a new th status symbol, like there there has to be a second, a second, at least a secondary third or fourth purpose besides just, oh, I like this tree and I want it in my living room. Right. Like that's a lot of work to go to. And the fact that like you can take a tree apart and put it back together and it's still considered living a is fascinating. But these trees are now going to be living with rods and cables inside of them, right? And this, I think, is sort of symbolic of this merger of man and machine as well, right? Like, is everyone out there human in the same way you and I think of ourselves are? Like, we even have to ask those questions of ourselves, right? Remember in the one of the opening scenes of Loki when he was going through that metal detector and they asked him if he was human, right? It, before he went, to, went in, because if, if he was lying, they would catch him or whatever. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, wouldn't, it, you know? And then he had to ask himself that question, would I even know if I wasn't? right you know and if you watch things like Westworld and whatnot right like there's I, I'm sure that we have all come across people that sort of look and seem to be like you and I but have you know other parts and pieces that we don't and you even like a, a different kind of iteration or version of this would be people who have like a rod in their shin because they broke their leg right, right or whatnot right the person is still alive but it's got this stuff inside of them that is not 
sort of the same fabric that they're made of, right? And how does that change someone? So anyway, I thought this was kind of interesting with your story about this tree having been chopped off and nothing much happening. And then it's generating these branches that have now come off, but you're going to, these, these branches are going to get new homes. And, and are these branches still alive? And what information do they hold? And who is going to have them? And what are they going to do with that stick, right? Like the stories of trees are probably as interesting as the stories of people. I, 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 I concur exactly. And I, I forgot about, I forgot about this and I may have even told the story um, on, on the show before um, this was like maybe two months ago, but um, I told the story about how one of the cats like brought in um, like a bunch of date baby birds, like real little mm -hmm. birds. Mm -hmm. And the, the girls were really upset. So we're like, all right, well, let's go and kind of like have like a closure experience with it. Um, and we went right in front of the tree, which I'm talking about. I dug a little hole and like we buried the birds right there. And we said like bird words uh, to the tree. Uh, and in my mind, I'm like, you know, you know I'm seeing it as, as a gift. Like when you begin to, to look in, into trees, like I haven't really read anything that kind of like hits exactly the angle which I'm coming from, but I can... Uh, uh, I can pull out, I can pull out information and then like kind of felt, uh, add it into my lens or narrative to like, what is a tree? But like, when you talk about the, like, the, there's a, there's a real popular book about 10 years ago called, I think it's called the secret life of trees. And it was basically mm -hmm. saying how just like with, within, uh, mushrooms in a natural environment, which are immensely connected through their root systems, like trees are too, in fact, the, an entire wooded area. And it talks about it, but typically when I've read about those, those types of analysis, Yes, there's like a there's a, a value brought to the living nature of of the environment, but it doesn't really go as as far as what I find interesting. So all of that being said, is thinking back to this feedback loop, like first, like, you know, um, and I'll use myself in the story is like, you know, recognizing this tree and just like having like some sort of like consciousness, like me recognizing it's something and then like giving it a gift. Uh, particularly with the birds and trees and birds obviously have connections and like to put the baby birds. And then like shortly thereafter, like, you know, being given back something else, like nothing, no other part of this tree bush broke off from the storm, just these three perfect, um, perfect branches. And realistically, I don't think like there's anyone else in the world who would find, you know, maybe like another sort of, there's no way that anyone could have as personal and as meaningful of a, a relationship with what those, those branches were like in terms of like how they lived their life. And that kind of goes into this, this relationship, which I think human beings have now to your point of like, well, what happens when we take like, you know, the tree and then it becomes like, you know, our, um, you know, it's, what is it being used for in that house? You know, and, and particularly when it's it's no longer part of like the grander, the the grander scale. And you can even say this about plants, to be quite honest. I think about this a lot when and I've got lots of house plants, but like what what are we even doing, you know, and, and with all of that sort of stuff? And and as we begin to play more and more with the natural world being much more than what we think or what we've been told it is, like it uh this 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 like um hostages in in the house in these houses of you know if you're spending two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just for a tree in your house like you know you're probably you probably have access to a billion dollars you know i'm just throwing making these numbers up like just in proportions you know that's you get buying a 25 five dollar house plant um and just like you know the that whole sort of thing and then putting in context like what's unfolding right in this world right now i'm finding all that fascinating so there's three things I want to respond with and just, I'm gonna note them so that I don't forget. I wanna talk about uh, the connection between birds and trees. I wanna talk about uh, foliage and zentangle animals and plants. And I wanna talk about um, these uh, yew trees and the ringing cedars, right? Okay. So there's people who like are into these things called yew trees. Like there's a guy, a, a listener of the show and, and friend of mine, Kristen was the one who kind of told me about this. Like she went to some workshop on the yew trees and like it's Isn't it yew? yew, yew trees. E-W, e let's I e think something. it's Y-E-W. 
I think it's Y-E-W, but they're a particular kind of tree and like the transformational sort of meditations and relationships and things like that. And I think it's somehow connected to this book that was popular sort of in the spirituality, conspiracy, kind of alternative information reality several years back called The Ringing Cedars. Um, okay. And so I'm thinking of this as we're talking. Um, also, your uh, uh, have you ever seen a tree that looks like it has a face in it? All the time. Right. And I'm, I'm wondering if sometimes think about how many people like bury their dead, dead animals or dead animals that they find right near trees or under trees, right? And I'm wondering sometimes when these knots or no nodules or sort of interesting formation of the way the cracks and crevices and the bark forms is somehow the entity or the energy of the living being sort of, you know, pushing itself into the tree. And, and there, it, it, you know, kind of, it's a, psych a different kind of circle of life than we think of it, right? But there, to circle back to an episode we did a while, quite a while back with your friend who created Zen tangles and de Zen doodles. I used to have like a Zen tangle kind of puzzle that had like this animal that was made out of leaves. It was like emerging from a bush and you couldn't tell if it was just the bush looked like the animal or if the animal was hiding behind the bush and sort of pressing through. And I see things like this sometimes in the psychedelic space as well. I couldn't find the exact picture I was thinking of, but here are some like examples of Zen tangles where like the animals are made of things that we think of like as plant part kind of things or, right. or, or whatever, right? I was trying to see, or like there's the animal that has the plant matter on it, but there was one in particular, right? Like that, you know, that I was think thinking of, but I can't seem to find it. If I, if I find it later, maybe I'll use it on the show thumbnail, um, but this relationship between plants and animals, like I wonder how deep that relationship goes, if it is like genetic or cross genetic in nature in a way that we don't quite understand, right? And the way animals and even like people who are in like military kinds of situations use foliage to camouflage themselves. I wonder if that sort of relationship of hiding within each other like merges in a way that we don't even understand. Right. And so um, that was what I was thinking of part of when you were talking, but these Zen tangle things really came to mind. I wish I could find the exact one that I was thinking of. Um, but uh, the other thing is, you know, we've spent a lot of time on the question of what exactly is going on with the birds. Like we've questioned birds, but what are the trees? Right. Like if the birds are somehow uh, surveillance drones or mechanistic in nature, not quite quite what we think they are, or at least some of them. W what about the trees? Are the trees maybe supercomputers, right? If the birds were drones, would the, I, it feels like the right relationship would be that the trees were some sort of supercomputer or hub or something like that, server or something. Um, and, you know, we can think about this in the natural sense of the word, or we can think about it in like, is nature really what we think it is? And I have this conversation with Sonia all the time because Sonia insists that what we think of as nature is just a different sort of technology. It's like a, a, a biological technology that is much more multi-purpose and beautiful than what we see now as mechanized technology. But when I'm looking at that tree, I'm gonna go back. When I'm looking at that tree in the person's house, right? No, that's not, in the person's house in the um, Wall Street Journal article, right? It's made, for some reason, this whole setup reminds me of this. I don't know if you ever saw the show Devs, um, but it was an interesting show that we watched for Conspiracy Cocktail. Uh, and they had this supercomputer that was but like kind of terrifying and beautiful, but it was held suspended. Let me find. So there's many uh, iterations of it, right? But it's parts and pieces put together. Let me see if I can find the exact picture that I'm thinking of, because it there was a picture that I used when we did the conspiracy cocktail, but basically this is, this is part of it, right? And then this is another part of it. This is what like sort of houses it all. And it's suspended in the middle of a room and has to be kept at a certain temperature. And there's like some things holding it in place, but basically it's almost levitating and the air pressure and the temperature and all that kind of stuff. Like you have to be very careful in this room. And then there's this thing in the middle that is kind of like a technological tree with roots and vines and branches, right? And that's at the center of it. And this is a computer that is able to see into the future and into the past 
and that they are able to use to sort of, the big question of the show is, is there free will or is reality deterministic, right? And so you think of trees sitting still in the same place for sometimes hundreds or thousands of years, watching, gathering information, storing things, right? Like, you know, it produces fruits, people eat them, right? There's this cycle that goes on with it that is not that dissimilar than the way information is spread and reintegrated and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of an interesting thing to sort of ponder. So those are the things that kind of came up while you were talking about your tree and the birds and why not? So it's, it's, it's interesting about the, the, the animals and the people and the trees. Um, there was, I, I can remember, I can remember when, um, my then wife and I were, were like pregnant when she was pregnant with, with our, with our children. And, um, she, uh, we, we birthed at home and that's a process, right? Like to, to prepare for that. And a, and a big part of it was, was the, like the restructuring of what you think childbirth is like, you know, away from what we've been taught versus, other things. And so you, so part of it was like a re-education process. And a lot of that was like all of these, like learning like new stories. And, and part of that was other, like, you know, not civilized, you know, not part of the civilization, the hierarchies, which we're part of, like, you know, the more natural way of living, um, like how other peoples have done it. And there was one story, which I, which, which sticks in my mind and I want to share right now. And I think it's very complimentary to what you're, where, where you're kind of suggesting. And it was talking about, you know, I don't know if this was like one or like, this was just a practice amongst a bunch of, a bunch of people, but whenever there would be like a stillborn or like a child, which would, um, which would die shortly after birth, that there was a tree within the community, within the tribe, whatever word you want to use, where the, where the, the child, the, the, the corpse of the, you know, the body is then buried at the foot of this tree. And then as the tree grows like that, that intermingling of like, of all of that, that material and the, yeah. The children would begin, you know, become part of the tree. And that was part of like, you know, where for whatever reason would, would, would the, the, that tribe or community would, would have a connection with the tree or the mothers would have connections with the tree or so forth. And it would last very long uh, for like, you know, generations and generations. And I always uh, thought there was, that was more than just a story that was like, you know, there, there's something like what you're talking about, like in terms of, of, um, of information and sharing information, and incorporating it uh, uh, within the community uh, in times to come, and just from from understanding the ecosystem, like you you hear this a lot of when a tree falls naturally, like there'll be like another hundred years of the tree decomposing into that natural world and releasing all of its wisdom, like what it learned about its environment, like back into the environment. So like that, that wisdom is taught. And that's one of the reasons why they're like, don't ever pull the tree from, from where it fell, because like, that's just half of its purpose or half of its life. And they're still filled with life. So uh, that makes so much sense to me um, that, that that's how things would be. Um, I just want to throw this out also, like the intermingling of, of, of the natural world and the Zen tangle is what I've been into owls for the past week, just because of the owl story I was telling. Yeah. And the more you look at owls, mm -hmm. like owls are cat birds. Like there is something called a cat bird, but when you look at the face and the behavior of an owl, like that's a cat, like they're the same freaking thing. Like somehow they're, they're, they're connected. They've got the same face, the same eyes, the same behavior. Well, this, and maybe this is where we'll go, like once, we, you know, sort of for the main bulk of the show, I have like a laundry list of possibilities here, but this merge, this unusual, this relationship between beings and nature, and then the merging of the way they come together. If you really think of what an owl is, it's almost like the, um, the, syn the synthesis of a cat and a tree. Okay. Right. Because if you look at their feathers, some of them look like the leaves or the things on the, on the, uh, you know, kind of the foliage of the tree and then their legs and their, and their, their claws and things like that look like sticks and branches. A lot of birds, like when we had that peacock on our golf course, it was crazy how the peacock's legs look like tree trunks, right? 
So uh, maybe we can get into that as we go. I have some stuff on owls that I think will be interesting considering all the owl stuff that's been coming up. But I do have, uh, before we finish the opening niceties and move on into the, 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 the main, the main, the main core. I thought this even became the main part of it, but go on. This is the part that's going to go on YouTube and that right kind of thing. I have a weird multiple reality, possible time travel on command story to share. All right. Are you ready? Okay, so. <laughs> hey guys, it's Emily. You just watched the opening clip of Playing the Glass Bead Game, episode number 21, The Owls Are Not What They Seem, with myself and Michael Wan. The topics covered in today's show are all listed below. And if you would like to join us for the full episode, directions on how to do that is down below. If you'd like a complimentary episode or a complimentary trip to the cafe and you have not received one yet, hit me up. We will see you guys next week for Project Kids. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend.